Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Mike here. We're still going down the history lane here, checking out some historical airplanes. And today we're gonna to be checking out a Fairchild PT-19. Stay tuned. Hello everybody, this is uh, Michael Kunit again. Um, this is a 1943 Fairchild PT-19. Uh, I own this airplane and my company Bay Aviation has been flying commercial rights in it for nearly 12 years now. Uh, we've flown with probably nearly 3,000 happy customers. So, it's a wonderful airplane. A PT stands for primary trainer. Uh, in 1940, the US Army Air Corps, which originally uh, purchased these airplanes and was responsible that they even got into production, they wanted a new primary trainer. In other words, the first aircraft that the cadets would fly when they went through this process of becoming military uh, aviators. Because the US Army Air Corps thought that why are we still training our cadets in biplanes if in fact all the frontline airplanes are monowings, blowing on, on top of that. So there was a design competition with this aircraft one. It was quite modern in its day. Uh, it has very forgiving um, flight characteristics. It's hard to stall and put into a spin. Uh, the controls are very light. Uh, they went quite at some length to, to make it all very light. They, they are not regular cable controls that work with the rods there on, from the stick. All of this is actually push-pull rods with, with bearings and, and trains. So for a primary trainer, this airplane has actually been quite well designed and appointed. Uh, it also, its most unusual feature though is the fact that it does not have either a radial engine where all the cylinders are grouped like this, like sun rays, uh, neither is it an opposed engine like the one over in the Cessna. All general aviation engines nowadays are opposed engines like in a Porsche car, you know, they, they face each other, either four of them or six of them. Well, this, in fact, is an inline six. So six cylinder in lines, which, of course, for an air-cooled engine, gives you a very, very difficult situation. How do you keep it cool? Because the last cylinder should run much hotter than the one up front there. The, the, one, the farther back you go, the less efficient the cooling should become. Well, the guys who designed this, this engine, they went to, to some length to overcome that problem. So it's a very efficient cooling system. And an inline six cylinder has the advantage that it's very, very smooth. And they put the engine upside down to give yourself more propeller clearance. So you can swing a longer propeller. Longer propellers are more efficient. And last of all, because of that shape, you can really cowl this up and make it quite a streamlined shape. So the engine is a, it's a Ranger 440 and it's the most unusual feature of the airplane. Uh, the other unusual feature is with the war about to happen, the design dates back to 1940, as we all know, in, in December, um, then in, in 41, the, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, so we were roughly about only a year away from that to happen. So they knew something, some war was, was about to, to happen, and they worried about that they would run out of aluminum. Therefore, this whole airplane is built out of wood. The wings are not only structurally wood, they're also, the, even the skin is wood. And wood has uh, quite some advantages. First of all, you have no rivets that protrude uh, and, and slow you down, creating drag. You also have a material that doesn't fatigue. If you ever, for chuckles, take a wooden cooking spoon and bend it back and forth. I mean, not to the point that you would break it, but you stay below that kind of, of force. You can bend that thing and bend it for months, for years, and it will never break. You take a metal sp cooking spoon and do the same thing after about 2,000 back and forth movements, it will break. So, so wood has quite some advantages. Its disadvantages, you can't leave it out in the ring. Wood air wooden airplanes will rot away. And from 1945 onwards, the military got rid of all these, of all these airplanes and uh, they sell, sold them off for basically the price of half a new Chevrolet. People who bought airplanes that cheaply, they didn't put them in hangars. So by 1960, the whole country was littered with, with rotten away 
uh, PT-19s, and in the early 70s, the first people started thinking, geez, when have we seen the last nice PT-19? And so they started, the first one started to be restored. As, as of today, there are only worldwide 98 of those that fly out of 7,600 built. And it's just simply what happened. They, they were not deemed worthwhile keeping. That's why all the airframes basically languished and, and, and rotted away. It's also very, very time consuming, therefore expensive to redo one of those. The wing center section, in other words, the wings, the outer panels come off here. There is just covers to keep the, the aerodynamic drag down. But those would come off and they are the bolts, the wing bolts. So you have the wing center section and that alone is about 1,200 man hours to redo. So you can send, basically sink a fortune into this airplane Jeez. and if you ever sell it, it would never fetch uh, what you have in it. So it's really people who love these airplanes who, who uh, went through the expense and, and the time to, to bring them back to life. Cool. Um, the training process, as I said, primary trainer meant first airplane that you flew, the first airplane you soloed in, the first airplane you flew aerobatics in, simple formation flying practice. It was expected of you that you soloed in 10 hours or less. If you hadn't soloed in 10 hours during the flight training process for the US Army Air Corps, you washed out. You may have, may have made navigator after or something like that, or bombardier, but you were not staying in the pilot program. Well, they were obviously rushing things. And because of that, in the course of, of World War II, 14,000 flight crew died in the training process. 14,000. So these are people, instructors, students, they never got a medal because they didn't make it to the front. All right, uh, let's go up to the front cockpit. That's, that's more, where more stuff is. So you see down there the pedals, they work the rudder. Here is the stick, pull and pu pull is up and, and forward is down on the elevator. These are the ailerons that make the airplane bang, sort of the same result like on a bicycle or motorcycle or figure skater. It's the banking actually that really makes the airplane turn. Then we have the airspeed indicator. Normal speed is around 90 to 100. Here's our altimeter. There is the slip indicator, it's a little hard to explain, but with that ball in the middle in the turn, I can make sure that, my, that I give enough rudder, neither too much nor too little. These are my engine gauges. The left one is oil pressure, the right is fuel pressure, because the tanks are lower than the engine, so we need a mechanical fuel pump that gets it all up. And so I need to have about three pounds of pressure, two to three pounds, uh, that I know my fuel pump is working and pumps enough gas up to the engine. Here is the tachometer. There's the G-meter if I fly some aerobatics in it. Um, I hardly ever do anything more than three and a half G's on this, you know, it's, it's not necessary. And with aerobatics the most important thing is to, to be basically smooth. Down there is the radio, underneath it the transponder and the square thing on top, that's the GPS. And that and the flaps here hard to see. It's that lever at the bottom there, like a parking brake lever, that works the flaps. And then here is the backup pump, the wobble pump, uh, to get fuel pressure if the mechanical pump uh, on the engine is, is dying. This is our intercom so we can talk. And there's the panel for all the electrical equipment to switch on and off. Sweet. Very spacious in there. I thought it would well, be they tighter. Like that. Don't forget, you fly these airplanes with a parachute. Oh, you need to get out of it. So you need the room to to wear the parachute because yeah. just the shape seems narrow compared to what it actually well, is the on the inside. But the, the cockpits are big. Yes. Oh wow, yes. pretty awesome. All right. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, I guess that would be it. Now, actually, one last question: If somebody wanted to get this today, do you know in terms of like price what they would end up spending? For a really nice one, 60. 60 grand. 60 grand. Okay. You All find right. them for less, but then they need a little bit of work. Okay. All right, awesome.